get right underway. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. We're going to be looking at calloused Christianity. Uh, you should have had a study sheet when you came in out there. Uh, I don't know if there's any more laying out there if you didn't grab one. Casey, just grab all of them. If you didn't get one, Casey will pass one out to you there. Um, if you remember, we have been going through the Gospel of Mark, uh, and we know that uh, Jesus has in, um, gone into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and uh, we know that he's um, touched a, a daughter with an unclean spirit. Uh, he's moved on and he's uh, departed from the coast of Tyre and Sidon and he came into the Sea of Galilee and he's uh, now come to the coast of Decapolis and he encounters a, a deaf and dumb man there that we looked at uh, Sunday night and um, when the folks saw what he'd done they were um, astonished beyond measure the Bible says uh, and they said he hath done all things well and uh, and when he does something, he does it well. Amen? And we're now in chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 1 through verse 21 tonight uh, And as we move on. It said, In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and said unto them, Doesn't it sound familiar? We've already seen one time uh, where the multitudes came and they have nothing to eat, haven't we? Uh, earlier, Okay. Uh, he said, I have compassion on the multitude uh, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, uh, for diverse or various of them came from far. And his disciple answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. If you remember, how many times was it last time? Five, and how many fishes? All right. This time they said, we've got seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to sit before them, and they did set them before the people. And they all had a few, few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. Uh, so they did eat and were filled, and they took up the broken meat that was left, in, left, that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came unto the parts of Damathatha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall be no sign given unto this generation." And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason you, because you have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have you not, excuse me, have your heart yet hardened? Have an eyes, see you not, and have an ears, hear you not? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves among five thousand? How many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said unto him, Twelve. And with the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it? that you do not understand. Well, uh, it's not the truth that you know, but the truth that you obey that results in your obedience or disobedience toward God and His Word. Our Lord seems to be focused on teaching His disciples who He is and what He's going to do. Uh, he's setting the stage for them to understand that as He moves toward the cross, uh, they need to be alert they need to be spiritually keen more than they ever have been. Yet they seem to be missing what he was teaching. As I read this and I see all the things that they've visibly seen him do, it's almost like I say, you know, when, when are these guys going to get it? Okay. Uh, as you read and journey through uh, the life of ministry as Mark gives his account. 
Uh, first of all, I want you to watch in the first uh, 10 verses, in verse 14 and verse 15, uh, I want you to notice uh, him. Jesus is refreshing the multitude. Refreshing the multitude. Uh, keep in mind as you read through this, uh, we've already had one occasion when he already had they had experienced him feeding the multitude. They'd come to hear him preach. And there again, they'd stayed three days. And he said, we can't send them home hungry. Uh, they'll starve to death. They'll, they'll famish by the wayside. Uh, they, what are we going to do? They begin to ask. Well, and he began to uh, supply that, that they needed to feed the multitudes that came to hear him speak. So uh, as you get to chapter 8, once again, we see, uh, notice under A, uh, they had forgotten what he had done in the past. Aren't we much like they are? We sometimes forget what he's done in the past for us. As you read the first 10 verses, that's what we're reminded of, is they had forgotten what he'd done in the past. Uh, secondly, I believe that they were so busy in doing ministry, they missed his message. If you remember, this thing started, they were weary, they were tired, and he's told them to go get some rest, but it seems like the crowds keep coming and they keep pursuing Jesus. Uh, they knew who he, who he was every time he got on the boat, every time he got off the boat in a new area. Uh, and he had, they, he had, they had to know that these men followed Jesus. And he involved them in the ministry he was doing as they distributed the fish and the bread in both of these settings. As he went and he healed these people, they were there. But I believe they were so busy in doing ministry that they possibly missed his message. He's showing them who he is and what he can do. He's showing them everything set in the stage for him to bring due to the fact that he's going to Calvary to die for their sins. So we see him refreshing the multitude. Here they are. They've been with him three days. They have nothing to eat. And he begins to refresh the multitude. If you look in verse 14, verse 15, uh, it says, Now the disciples have forgotten to take bread, neither have they in the ship with them more than one loaf. They had become so busy refreshing the multitude, they didn't make any preparation to refresh themselves. Let me say this to you who teach and serve with kids and, and, and really in any capacity of ministry, every single person that studies and prepares and, and, and brings forth the Word of God right up from the pastor on down to every person, you need to make sure that you have times of refreshing so that you can get a, just get away from everything and refresh yourself. You can get so busy doing ministry that you'll miss His message. If we're not careful, we can do that as lay people as well. Well, so we see him refreshing the multitude, first of all. And then secondly, when you get to verse 11 through verse 13, you see Jesus refusing the Pharisees. Uh, notice verse 11. Now he's gone to, into the parts of Damanatha, and the Pharisees came forth. Verse 11, they seem to always show up. They're, they're in every church. They're in every community. Uh, they come forth and they begin to question with him. Uh, notice their intent. Seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. So we see him refusing the Pharisees. First of all, I want you to notice their challenge. Their challenge is found right there in verse 11. What are they doing? They're seeking of him, verse 11 says, a sign from heaven, tempting him. In other words, uh, they wanna, their challenge is that they want a sign from heaven. A miracle that would be an authenticating miracle that, that would validate his ministry, that he was the Son of God. Now, keep in mind, uh, they didn't want someone sick, deaf, blind, or lame healed. They weren't worried about all that. Uh, and he had done that before them, and evidently they had heard about that. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to call down fire from heaven. Uh, they wanted him to call down bread from heaven like the Old Testament prophets did. That's what they were after. They didn't want Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. They wanted a miracle. They wanted a miracle like Elijah. Uh, they wanted a miracle like Jeremiah. They wanted a miracle. But here's the problem, folks. Listen, they had a miracle before them. They had the sinless, spotless Lamb of God working in their presence and they were denying what He was doing. Well, look at Jesus' denial in verse 12 and verse 13. And by the way, let me stop right there just a moment. 
We've got a lot of folks like that today. They want something miraculous. They're looking for something miraculous. They're wanting a sign from heaven. Okay? And, and we, can't, we can't look to signs. Uh, stay with me for just a moment. Look at Jesus' denial. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? I said, There shall be, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Why is he saying that? Well, Folks, the reason being the sign was Jesus himself. He was the miracle. He was the one that was born of a virgin birth. He was the literal son of God. He was the Messiah doing what the work of the Father right in their very presence. You see, but there's another sign that he's pointing toward as we move on. Uh, the sign would be the miracle of the resurrection. Now, as you go over to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, there is a, a, a parallel text that goes with this. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, if you want to just put down any margin of your notes or somewhere, if you remember, Matthew sort of mentions it like this. He said, you wicked and adulterous generation, in verse 4, seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it. Here it is. But the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah, and he left them and departed. Now look at Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 38 through verse 41. That's the second time he encountered these birds. But look what he said in chapter 12, uh, verse 38 through verse 41. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, here it is again, uh, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonah. He goes on to say in verse 44, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment of this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. <laughs> what was he saying? He said, guys, I want to illustrate what's going to happen. He said, the prophet Jonah is an illustration of exactly what's going to take place in my life. He said, I'm going to be in the belly of the grave. I'm going to be in the belly of hell uh, for three days. And he said, I'm coming out. Uh, just like Jonah came out, I'm coming out. Uh, the sign would be the miracle of the resurrection. And he uses that Old Testament story of Jonah to show the truth of the fact that one day that there would be a resurrection. So Jesus denies them a miracle. He was the miracle. He is the miracle. He's going to be the miracle. They didn't need another miracle. So we see Jesus refusing the Pharisees. They want a sign from heaven. They want fire to come down from heaven. They want bread from heaven. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted entertainment. They wanted another miracle. They wanted a miracle like they wanted to see like the Old Testament prophets and he says, hey guys, don't ignore the miracle that happened in Jonah's life because that's, I'm going to repeat, in a sense, the miracle of the resurrection that Jonah experienced. I too will be the resurrected one. Well, we see Jesus refreshing the multitude in this chapter. We see Jesus refreshing the Phar refusing the Pharisees, excuse me. But then we see Jesus rebuking the disciples. When you get to verse 14 through verse 21, notice I've already read one time, but just to refresh your memory, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. <laughs> Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them. He said, he says, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Notice verse 16. The Bible says, and they reason. That word reason, mean, it means to debate. It means to argue. Uh, they, they broke out in a big argument among themselves and, and what they begin to blame each other. They said, he's saying this because we have no bread. Uh, he, he, it's because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, verse 17, he said, to, he says, why? Why are you guys arguing over this? He said, because you have no bread. Why are you arguing over the lack of bread? Can you not, he says, perceive you not yet? Do you not see what I'm trying to teach? Do you, do you not understand are your hearts so hard? 
Are your eyes so blind? Are your ears so deaf that you can't remember? Do you not remember back when I broke, verse 19, the five loaves among 5,000? And how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they say unto him, Twelve. He said, well, let me go back just a little farther. And when those seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, seven. And here he is again. And he says, how is it you don't understand? He says, guys, look at it. He, look, we see their reasoning in verse 14 through verse 16. They're reasoning over this bread. They're reasoning why they're in the situation they're in. You see, the problem was, folk, they had lost focus. They had lost focus. It, they were as blind as the Pharisees. They're arguing over who forgot the bread. Well, why argue and worry over a loaf of bread when you have the bread of life on the boat? Amen? And that's what Jesus was saying. Why are you arguing over bread when you got the bread of life on the boat? Have they so soon forgotten the two occasions on which he had fed over 10,000 people? Can he not provide for them now? You know, that reminds you and I tonight, folks. How quickly, too, uh, that we can forget of his past provisions. How easy we do, how, how easy it is to forget and begin to doubt his care for us as believers. We need to remind ourselves as we read this scripture, we need to be very careful that we don't, that we don't forget God's goodness and his provision. And every now and then we just need to be reminded of what he's brought us through, where, how he's been there for us. Every now and then it's good to go look in the cabinets uh, and look in your cupboard and say, hey, thank God for the navy beans and the pintos. Thank him for the macaroni and cheese. A amen. Uh, I thank him I got it for the grandkids, not myself. Uh, but, but thank him. I can remember we didn't have anything in our cabinets. Amen. I can remember borrowing five dollars from my grandma uh, to buy a cheeseburger at Hardy's till I got my paycheck so I could pay her back. Every now and then it's good to look back in those little windows of life and say, glory to God, thank you for your provision. He, he begins to rebuke the disciples. And you know what happens? You know what happens when we lose our focus? We become forgetful of what God's done and what He's doing and wants to do in our lives. And that's where they're at, folks. We've got to catch ourselves not getting in that same predicament. Well, we see their reasoning, but look at the rebuke. Uh, look at verse 15. And, and he charged them. He rebuked them. Uh, he, said, he, he said, take heed. He said, God, stop and think just, just a moment. Uh, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herod. Now look at verse 17 through verse 21. And when, and when he knew what was going on and saw their, heard their argument, uh, and knew the argument. He said, why reason you because you have no bread? Don't you see what I'm trying to teach you yet? Don't you understand? Are your heart so hard? Are your eyes so blind? What's he getting at? Look at the rebuke. Folks, their mind, their minds were dull. Their hearts were hard according to Scripture. Their eyes were blind and their ears were deaf to what he was doing around them. Now, now, their focus, look, their focus is on bread. <laughs> but Jesus' focus is on another bread. He's, all, he's interested in this thing of leaven. Okay? What's he trying to show them? You see, leaven represents the presence of evil. And everywhere the Pharisees went, he wanted them to understand, everywhere he, they saw the Pharisees, that they were going to be up to no good. They were up to evil. It represents... Uh, and the presence of evil and the pressures of evil. And folks, as we understand leaven in the Scripture, leaven represents false doctrine, unpurged sin in the church. It also represents hypocrisy. And as he looked at those, those things, let me give you just a few moments uh, of references of Scripture that remind us of what Jesus said about leaven. Listen to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 10. I'm going to read that in the New Trip Living Translation because it's so, so simple. He said, So Christ, Paul writes, has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery descent to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. 
For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, uh, you've been cut off from Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. In verse 6, he goes on to say this. When we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there's no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Now keep in mind that the Pharisees said that in order, uh, listen, you had to become a Jew before you could become a Christian. They said you had to be, you had to follow the circumcision before you could be a part of the family of God. And Paul is refuting that. And that carried over into the church of Galatia uh, and they were quickly returning to the law. He said in verse 6, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, there's no benefit of being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. He says, you were running the race so well, who has led you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he's the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching, here it is, is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. He says, I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. You see, all it takes is a little bit of confusion. All it takes is a little bit of false doctrine. All it takes is a, a little bit of leaven to cause the whole lump to rise and get out of sync. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through verse 8, he says, you're boasting about this terrible, to give you the backdrop, uh, there was an incestuous relationship here with some family members and Paul is rebuking that situation. They're churching this guy, okay? And he comes back and, and, and he says, you're boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you'll be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is that which is what you really are, Christ our Passover. What's he saying? He said, our Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Paul says, listen. He said, this thing... Uh, he says, you're bragging about the fact that you've, you've allowed some of this to take place in your church. He says, you've got to get rid of the old yeast by remove, removing that wicked person from among you. You see, they were celebrating in a sense of the fact that uh, they were a forgiving church, that they were a tolerant church. And Paul says, wait a minute, uh, a little leaven will begin to contaminate the whole church. It'll put permeate and it'll pollute the gospel. You see, that's what we got to be very careful of today. We can't. We got to be very careful that we don't ignore uh, sin in the congregation. Well, how, what's that so important? Why is he saying? Why is he telling them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? You see, the Pharisees practiced and, and encouraged hypocrisy. Okay, uh, their motto was this: say one thing and do another. Paul says, listen, you need to be aware of that doctrine. You need to be aware of their practices. You need to be aware of their leaven. You can't say one thing and do another. That's what they do, but you can't do that. You have to be cautious of that. And he charged, he said, take heed. Don't get caught in their trap. And then he goes on, he says, not only the leaven of the Pharisees, but all the leaven of Herod. You know, it's interesting that in every occasion, even in this occasion when they're on this ship uh, without bread, we find that Jesus uses it as a teaching moment. You want to know why? That, just, like they are, just like these guys we're learning in every facet of our lives, every, everything we go through. Well, what was it that the, the leaven of Herod? Well, we know that uh, the Herodians are stemmed from uh, Herod. The Her Herodians represented liberalism and worldliness. You see, it represents the church with no dedication, no separation, and no conviction based on the authority of the Word of God. He says, don't you get caught into that. that take heed. Don't get, beware. Don't get caught into those traps of the philosophies of those doctrines. And then we have the Sadducees. He doesn't mention them, and I'm going to. The Sadducees were all about liberalism. They were about 
uh, they believed in nothing supernatural. Matter of fact, they they didn't believe in the resurrection. They they accepted no supernatural. The Sadducees they they would not accept miracles. Okay, they believed no in no miracles at all. So that tells you the problems they have with Jesus. Well, look at verse seventeen once again. As I come to conclusion. Jesus really, as you break this down, begin to ask them nine distinct questions. He's desiring to arouse them and help them refocus. Okay? Why? Because they have become spiritually lethargic. Okay? And Jesus wants them to examine their hearts. Look what he says in verse 17. He says, Why, why reason you? Because you have no bread. Perceive not you not yet, neither understand. Don't you see what I've been trying to teach, what I've been trying to say? Look at the last question. Have you or have ye your heart yet hardened? You see, they've become spiritually lethargic. Jesus wants them to examine their heart. The problem is not, it's not their hunger for bread, it's their hunger for truth. There's where the problem is. They've lost their hunger for truth. He says, hey, hey guys, you need to stop and look at your hearts. Are they hardened? That little word hardened is an interesting question. Or a little, little interesting word. It means to cover with a callus. You ever had any calluses? Well, they're aggravating, aren't they? You work in the garden or somewhere all day with a hoe or a shovel or a rake. You can get calluses on your feet. Uh, and they, they can be hard, and, and they can be tough to get rid of. The same thing is spiritually true. You see, they're getting to the place now, they've become so familiar with Jesus healing and doing the things He's doing, they become so familiar, uh, they become hardened toward His ministry. Uh, they have become calloused toward the things of God. You see... The truth of the matter is, as we look at these scripture, he comes back in verse 21, he reminds them of what's happened. He says, guys, how is it that you do not understand? You see, he's tried to show them simply who he is, why he's here, and where he's going. You know, it's easy for you and I as well to become callous Christians if we're not careful. I begin to think about what he's trying to say here and how this can relate to us. How does it happen? Okay? How, how does it happen? How do you and I become callous Christians? How do we become, get to the place where we try to cover up things in our life? Where is it that we don't hear and see what God's doing? How is it? Okay. Number one, uh, it's in, in your conclusion on your outline, I think. Number one, how does it happen? When we begin to look for a sign and we ne neglect the Scripture. That's how it all started. They were, they, the, listen, the, the Pharisees wanted a sign. And if we're not careful, when we begin to be more interested in signs than we are Scripture, you know, there's a lot of people today. I mean, some of the recent things that we've had happen uh, with these planets passing so close to the earth. And, man, you, you, you can get a whole gang of people to go out and moon watch and, and watch Mars and all, uh, all the people, all the excitement of, of them landing on Mars and, uh, this past week. And just the groves of people, if you watch them celebrate and clap, you know, there's a whole lot of folks that spend all their life doing that. But they won't pay a bit of interest to God's Word. And there's people who look for a sign and neglect the Scripture. That's how it happens. And by the way, it can happen to Christian people too. Secondly, how does it happen? How do we become callous Christians when we begin to focus on what we lack instead of what He's already given? They begin to focus on what they lack. They didn't have any bread. They had forgotten on the two occasions where he had provided bread and fishes for over 10,000 people. And he provided it for them. Uh, when he, listen, when he provided for them, uh, surely they're following Jesus and living for Jesus, helping him in ministry. He's surely going to provide for them. Amen? God's going to take good care of us, folks. Doesn't mean that we're going to get everything we want. Listen, but he'll provide everything we need according to his riches and glory, Paul said. When we begin to focus on what we lack instead of what he's already given. You see, we can do that individually. We can do that as a family. We can do that as a church. Thirdly, 
when we fail to receive and respond to the truth He gives us. That's what they had done. They failed to respond to the truth that He had given them. They had no clue. They're still so worried about this bread. They're missing the message of this thing of leaven of the Pharisees and, and, and that of Herod. It's like they didn't even hear what He said because they're so consumed they're so consumed, they failed to receive and respond to the truth He was given. Folks, if we're not careful, we can become so consumed with tradition and so many other things today with our lives, our, our jobs, uh, our hobbies, and we, we can go on and on that we fail to respond to the truth that He gives us. And then lastly, when we focus on the temporal more than we do the eternal. You see, they're focusing on that that's temporal. Sure, they need bread. Jesus knows they need bread to be uh, satisfied or uh, to resolve their hunger. But folks, they, they're, they're, they missed it. They're focusing on the temporal more than they are the eternal. He's only going to be with them for just a short time. We've already moved in almost, to, I think, somewhere around the third year of His earthly ministry. And they're going to miss everything He's going to say if they don't start perking their ears up, if they don't start looking for spiritual things instead of physical and carnal things. You know why? Because they're becoming calloused. They're becoming calloused father followers of Jesus. Well, I think that's the truth of this Scripture. We'll move a little further next time. Let me just remind you, that's exactly how it happens. It's how it happened to them.